Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Um, I'm going to start looking at Daniel 11, verse 37 to 39. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence as we open your word. We're so thankful that we can be together and uh, we pray for one another, for those studying these uh, studies, that following these studies and taking time to study on their own and to understand what is truth. We know, Lord, that there's many distractions in this world. But we ask that we can focus upon you, and upon what you want to do in our lives, in the lives of those around us. We know that we face many trials and difficulties. We ask for your presence in our lives, that you can give us strength to endure these trials, to trust in you in spite of what we see. We pray for uh, our families. We know that there's health problems and different issues that uh, the people around us face, and we pray that we can represent you and point people in a a direction that will draw them close to you, that they may receive healing. And um, we ask, Lord, that this study in Daniel chapter 11, that you can help us to see clearly the present truth application of these lines, how they apply to us as a movement and us to us as individuals. And we thank you for this, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. I'm pretty sure we, we finished with this section as far as we can right now verse 36 so i was going to move on to verse 37 to 39 and and first of course we just review the historical application now in this case this is a continued description of the man of sin of the papacy that in obviously in verse 40 that the king of the south atheism France is going to come against, and then uh, the power that's going to combine with the United States uh, to respond, right? So uh, the repeat of Rafi and Panium. So in this history, we we have the, the 1260 years, and this is just the characterization of that papal power during that period. So it's already addressed uh, the end of that till the indignation be uh, accomplished. Um, for that that is determined shall be done, right? So this is just a further description of this man of sin. Now, we know, of course, Uriah Smith tries to make this a description of France, and he's going to have three powers, the king of the north and the king of the south, and France in verse 40. Uh, but we can see that this is really a description of what we see of the man of sin in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, as far as trying to make a present truth application of this, this is just a description of something, but that description should have a present truth application, even though it's not, it's not describing a history as such, like it's not describing a series of events here. It's just describing what the papacy is like. So it says, neither shall he papal Rome regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Now, we place that in uh, historically dealing with the celibacy of the Catholic clergy. I mean, that's how we've traditionally always done that. I, I accept that, that that's sound. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of fortresses. So this is referring to civil authority. A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones and pleasant things. And thus shall. And so that's going to refer to idolatrous worship. So we got uh, obviously we connect all of those types of things with idols. And thus shall he do in the most strongholds. And uh, we take this stronghold to be a reference to the Pantheon in Rome uh, with a strange God. Now, now we have their Mary worship, so that was uh, Swearingen's idea, and we, we hemmed and hawed about it. We kind of left it in. 
whom shall he, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall um, cause them to rule over many, over many, which we say is Christendom, and shall divide the land for gain. So ecclesiastical conquest through papal authority. So that's that's how we took the historical application. Now, as far as trying to put this into a present truth application, I mean, this is describing the papacy and the papacy is going to be characterized at the end of the world. But exactly where to place this description, I mean, it is the papacy. But if we connect it to the idea of the man of sin, it would also, I think, connect in some ways with you know, Satan's personation of Christ, maybe, but I, I'm not really sure. So I'm, I'm not sure how to approach these three verses. Now, the first thing when it says he, uh, uh, the desire of woman also so can represent the Christian's desire of ages, nations, Jesus Christ. So this is Angela writing this here, um, with women representing churches. And yeah, I, I don't know. Well, first, when we say he shall not regard the God of his fathers. Now, we, we have there the true God, right? Whether that is exactly what's understood or if this is, because the question is, who is his father? That is papal Rome. So we, we left some of this stuff in here or put some of this stuff in here with the historical application. But we always reexamine it again when we go through the present truth application. Alan White calls the papacy the masterpiece of Satan. So we know who founded it. Yes. Yeah, we understand that. Um, but the question is, if he's not going to regard the God of his fathers, that is this man of sin, the question is, is that referring to uh, the Christian God or the pagan God? If you understand what I mean, that is it just describing a change in how it's manifesting its worship, right? So they're not going to be talking about Apollo and, and all of these different things. They're going to be talking about... Unless you come to Pope Francis, he'll no doubt be saying it's okay to do this and that, because that's what he's doing. He is actually disintegrating the, the Catholics' uh, faith, that the ones who really believe in Christ. Right, but let's not, let's not deal with Francis yet. Let's deal with just the historical application. <laughs> So when we, when we're looking at this period of 1260 years, that, you know, it could be that this could be translated this way. Now, if, if we look at the, the Hebrew, the 430 there in, so let me see here. You know, just share the screen so you can see what I'm doing. So in Daniel chapter 11, verse 37, um, he shall not regard the God of his fathers, right? But if you look at the Hebrew, there isn't really a distinction. So here they have Elohim is the word, uh, but the form there, oh, I'm still sharing, sorry. There we go. So it's this number 430 here. So you know, it says Elohim. Now, if you look at it, it's just got a different form here. It's still plural, El Elohim. Right. It doesn't have the M at the end, the mem. Uh, but that's simply because the word itself is, is, uh, has attached to it the, his, uh, his God. So I'm just going to look this up here. Just hang on just to make sure, um, what that form is. Yeah. So it's the masculine plural. L O he is how it's pronounced here. It doesn't have the mem. So the, the point that I'm making is that this can be translated the gods of his fathers, right? That there isn't, it's, it's, so I'm going to cross this out. Um, I guess I have to do it here. And I'm going to put gods. Right? So I put that in italics to show the gods of his fathers. And in this case, uh, we're going to change this here. So instead of saying that this is the true God, right? So, and I'm not sure why I put it under father. So the God, the gods of his fathers. So gods that is 
the pagan gods, even though we can see that Catholicism is paganism in Christian garb, it's 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 going to be just changing the names of those gods and, and giving them a Christian dressing. So the fathers then of the papacy would be, you know, paganism, right? That's going to be the father of papalism. So we've had this change from paganism to papalism, and it's going to describe the man of sin, right? It, it starts that in verse 36, but it's going to describe more characteristics. So when it says the gods of his fathers, it's not referring to the true God here. It's referring to the pagan gods. Now, as nor the desire of women. Now, I still think that in the historical application, that should be the celibacy of the Catholic clergy. I, I think that's what generally would be understood. But let's examine it a little bit. So this idea of desire uh, is is it's not talking about lust or anything. It's talking about goodly, pleasant, precious, and and then woman is just isha. But it, it says he's not regarding the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor re, nor regard any God. Now, there's a number of of words here. So obviously, uh, the whole, right? That's the word uh, kol. That's uh, would be translated as um, any, right? Uh, then three eight zero eight. That's just low. That means not. So, so they have them in a different order, not. And then uh, regard. That's the word being. Excuse me. Yep. Okay, Dwight. Hi, Dwight. Your dyslexia is showing. My dyslexia. Desire should be two five three two. Okay. So, oh yes, it should be. Okay. So two five three two is. Uh, yeah, it's it's not really true, Delexia. It's just bad typing. Welcome to the club. I think there are I many mothers of of children. Sorry, of priests and many children of priests and other clergy who are demanding recompense. So no, so much for celibacy. They might take the vow, but a lot of them don't live by it. Yeah, I understand. Um, so um, the question is, what does this desire of women mean? So two, five, three, two is what you said? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so two, five, three, two. Now, it's the same words that use the desire of all nations in Haggai 2, verse 7. That's the first. But we all, don't we also find this with rule of first mention in First Samuel 9, 20? Yeah, Um and and as thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. On whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? Okay, yeah. So, so now, and in the rule of first mention, the desire of Israel was to have a king, right? Yeah. What was the great desire of women before Christ's coming? Wasn't uh, it? Honestly, they, wasn't it that they would give birth to the savior? Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I think, you know, we could, we could interpret this in some other way than the celibacy of the clergy, that this is a rejection of, right. So, Cause traditionally that's how we've always interpreted this, but how else could we look at this then? How would we characterize this? That is the rejection of the promised seed. Right. That's one way. I mean, there might be some better way of doing the rejection of Christ. So if he's, so we could say he doesn't regard the pagan gods, nor the promised seed, right? The desire of women, which would be the promised seed, uh, nor regard any god, right? So he regards himself as God, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, so it's it's not atheism, right? Which Uriah Smith tries to say that it is like because he tries to make this friends but it's just he magnifies himself above all he becomes the supreme religious authority that is god on earth right? right that's the idea of the papacy so so christ himself the promised seed he rejects 
um, rejects the pagan gods, you know, at least in name, right? But it is still is a type of paganism, but it's it's a different type. Now, then it says, but in his estate, he shall honor the god of fortresses. So in his position, right, that's the idea of the word estate. He honors the god of forces, the King James says, but it's really fortresses. And so he had, this refers to the super, supreme civil authority of the papacy, right? So we have the supreme religious authority and now the supreme civil authority. Now, I think it's in his love's books where it's, book where it says uh, God is goddess. Now, I've just looked it up in Esau and it's definitely God. It's not goddess. What, what, what are you talking about, goddess? I, I didn't catch uh, what you the goddess of fortresses, whatever name that goddess, uh, multiple names that goddess has. I'm pretty sure it's Hislop that said that. I'm sure other people have too. So beware of Hislop's the two Babylons, as you had warned me about years ago, Theodore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The book, The Two Babylons, it's not very good scholarship. Um, but anyway, so they say it's goddess of fortresses. I'm almost certain that's where I found that. Yeah, I still have the book, but I'm I'm sort of tempted to burn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it's uh, I don't know if I would burn a book. I always use books for references. Okay. So when we're looking at this estate, yeah, is I mean in in this situation using e sword, this is estate Hebrew 3653 is being used in the form of a noun rather than that of an adjective would that be correct it's a noun right the same word is Hebrew 3651 correct well I have to look at 36 yeah well they're related because it just it means to stand I mean, but it means lots of things, right? It's a, it's a pretty broad word. I mean, the the three six five one uh, is mostly translated as the word so, and and therefore is the second com- most common way, and wherefore and thus and afterward and this and likewise and so forth, and it really only is translated as like state once. So, I don't know. They must have some relationship to it. So, so the word 3651 is can, right? That's, and, and normally, like when my friend David Kadash would be talking to his mom on the phone, uh, he would, she would be talking because she's a woman, she talks a lot, and he'd just be going, can, 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 which means, yeah, like sort of, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, that like that is or whatever thus or so, right? You know, uh, he kind of used it in a sense like yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so that's the way that I understand that word. Um, anyway, what's the point there with? Um, okay, three six five one is usually used to be able to describe something else. Adjective. Well. Uh, well, it's sometimes an adverb. Okay. Still descriptive. So, yeah, it describes a verb. It's, it's, uh, okay. But yeah, I just don't think they're really that related. I mean, the, the with the Brown Drivers Briggs, I mean, they're going to bring us back to, uh, the root five, three, five, five, nine, which is the primitive root, which means to be erect. Right. So it's see, for me, it's it's kind of intriguing because we've encountered this word before. Yeah, we've encountered it three times already just in Daniel 11. Mm-hmm. Now, each time that we've encountered it in the in the previous verses, we're looking at a a force, a person a whatever that has a specific estate, a, a specific office, a specific purpose. 
because Daniel eleven seven, but right. out of a branch of her root shall one stand up in his and in his estate shall come with an army. Right. So it's kind of like a place or correct. A position, right. So I, that's why I just say it's a position in you know in his place, right? And that that can go right back to the rule of first mention where we had the where we had Genesis forty thirteen involved. Okay. Yeah, so that's where it's going to have, uh, yeah, within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, right? So that's right. what you see. Right. So, so that's kind of how we're, we're taking this, right? So it's, uh, I put like position, uh, you know, I could put place, maybe I'll just change that to place, but in his place shall he honor the God of fortresses. I'm not arguing against your choice of position. That's fine. I know. I'm just saying I think place might be better. Just as more colloquial. So then, so we have the supreme religious authority that he is, he's not honoring any other God above himself. He is the God on earth. And, and in his place, he's going to give honor to, to military might, right? fortresses or supreme civil that gives him supreme civil authority right during the 1260 he, i mean he's the one who sets up kings and takes down kings so to speak which is really what god does but he's and remember that he's given the power seat and great authority in um revelation 13 the dragon gives the papacy his power seat and great authority now the power you know, that's something that they can give and the seat. But the authority um, in that case is going to be religious authority here. It's just so it would be the supreme religious authority. That's something that paganism really couldn't give. It couldn't give it could give him its its power, which is the civil authority in this case, and its seat, which is Rome. But it, it couldn't give him his religious authority because he didn't have it. But the papacy, it receives that. So it's something that's not rightfully that of paganism, if, if that makes sense. I'm not saying it very well. But but this supreme civil authority, he's going to honor. So that, that would be the power. And then we have uh, this third thing, if we want to look at it to try to understand this. A God whom his fathers knew not shall we honor with gold, silver, and precious stones, pleasant things. And the question is, what is this God that his fathers knew not? So we have uh, the God of his fathers, he does not regard, right? nor the desire of women, uh, that of Christ, nor of any God, because he's God. And he honors the God of fortresses. But then there is a God whom his fathers knew not. Now, in dealing with Swearingen, he's going to you know, deal with Mary worship. And that to me doesn't really make sense as a God whom his fathers knew not. We have that in here, you know, strange God, Mary worship. But I think there must be something else because they did worship, you know, the mother and the child, his fathers, paganism did. So, but maybe what this could be is the, that the, the God whom his fathers knew not, maybe this would refer to the Christian God, but he's going to honor it with all of this, these idols. Does, does that make sense? So we're, we're taking a different. It certainly yeah. does. Because if you go to the Vatican, I haven't been there personally. I've certainly seen films about it. This is all to the glory of God. Yeah, it's to the glory of God, the Pope. It's Catholicism. It's not to God in heaven. Okay, so I, I'm right. But they're honoring the God of heaven with idolatry. Right? Uh, you can't honor him with idolatry. That's just I understand. Problem. But it's not truly honoring in, the, in a proper way. But we can say that what the papacy has done is set up all of these Christian idols, right? I mean, they have Jesus on the cross, you know, the, the crucifix with Jesus being crucified. You know, it's 
you know, it's 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 an idol, right? People use yes, indeed. Right? So all I'm saying is that so this God that they're fathers, because if we're saying the fathers are is paganism, well, paganism wasn't worshiping Christianity, right? So what they've done is they've taken the true God and they've made idols, right? So that's the gold, the silver, the precious stones, and the pleasant things. Okay. That to me makes more sense. I don't know if people are going to agree with me on that one. But if we're going to say a God that his fathers knew not, it must be, in that case, God. So the God his fathers knew not, uh, reference to the Christian God. For some reason, this always my keyboard changes. I'm not sure why. To a French keyboard. Honors with idolatrous worship. So the idea is that he's going to honor the Christian God with idolatrous worship. So that's not true honor. Okay. What do people think about this change to the historical application? I think it makes it make more sense. Let's kind of continue and see how all this plays out. Now, um, so this shall he do in the most strongholds. Now, we put here, and part of the problem with this, so when we have most strongholds, uh, we have, of course, a fortress. Fortification is a stronghold. And then we also, so we have two different words. We have uh, Ma'oz, 4581, which is a fortified place. But that is a defense, right? So that's a, a rock, a strength, a stronghold. And then we have a 4013. And 4013 means a fortification, a castle, or fortified city. So we have two different words that basically mean the same thing. And that one's Mibsar. Mibsar. And that's why they put most strongholds. What they're, what they're doing here is they're taking this idea of the Hebrew idiom of doubling a word, uh, as an intensification. So they don't have the word most in Hebrew, but they'll just repeat a word twice. But here there's two different words that mean the same thing. And this idea that he shall do this in the most strongholds and, um, in, uh, now they have in the most strongholds. Now, normally, if you're going to have in, you're going to have uh, a prefix in front of the word strongholds. Uh, that's going to be a bet. That is the letter B. But in this case, they have a lamid. Now, a lamid means to or against. Right. A bet means in. <coughs> Sometimes between, but so uh, the way that this is structured is kind of odd in, in that sense. To translate it in the most strongholds wouldn't really make sense. So, so, so shall he do. So we got this noun, masculine plural, fortress. That's uh, it's got the lamed in front. So le le mid esere, right? And then we have the word itself, ma'atz, but it's in the plural, ma'atzim. So it's a masculine plural. So both of these, and it's like a place of safety, a refuge in the Strongs. And uh, the other one's just like a fortress. So it's a fortress of refuge or safety. And he's going to do this against the most strongholds, not in the most strongholds. Would that change the meaning of this? Yeah, so thus shall he do, it wouldn't be in, right? We would have to take this word in, if we're going to just translate it as the Hebrew says, we would cross that out and put in and replace it with against, which I put in italics to show that I added it. It doesn't mean it's an added word. You know, it's just instead of in, we put against, against the most strongholds. Now, if we think, so if this is against the most strongholds, is this against the, against the pantheon in Rome? I mean, it could mean the same thing, basically, like in against, in the most strongholds. That is, 
what they have done is they've taken this strange god, and the strange god in this case is this. Uh, instead of Mary worship, I'll do it this way: the syncretistic Christian god. That is this this mixture of paganism and Christianity god. So against the the strongholds, but it could also be referring to of the strongholds here could be referring instead of to the pantheon, but the pagan uh, strongholds or fortresses, but maybe against the Christians who have fled into the wilderness, that these strongholds, these fortresses or places of refuge are the mountains and, and like this would be against the Walden seas and, and so forth. And, and they bring this strange God, this syncretistic Christian God, who that he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, right? So I, I don't know if that that makes sense to people. That this then is what it's describing here is this mixture of Christian symbolism, let's say, with this anti-Christian philosophy that's really just paganism. So whether we want to keep the pantheon in Rome or we want to say that the most strongholds refers to a place of refuge where the Christians have fled. I don't know. I'm going to put that in there. We may change it. So with this most strongholds that we're talking yeah. about, yeah, we have this, how would you say it? Mibsarath? Yeah. Mibsarath? Mibsarath. Yeah. Maoze or Maoz? Maoz, Maoz, yeah, Maoz, yeah. So you got these two words, and it and it says it has a lament at the beginning in the Hebrew, right? In in this sentence, right, which means against the most strongholds, not in the most strongholds, right? Against, and and this would make sense if he's going to take these images and idols and so forth, this idolatrous worship, and he's going to do this against the most strongholds. And if we look at what happened with, uh, you know, the Christians who, who fled into the wilderness, um, eventually they're going to be overcome by a lot of this idolatry. Now, first, when, when the Catholics are just killing them, that's they're actually stronger. But when they start to make these leagues with the Catholics, um, that's when they start departing from the truth, right? So the Catholic Church realized it. The best thing to do was to to make concessions and allow them certain freedoms. Uh, but in doing so, they they end up getting won over in the end, right? So they become more like Catholics. So all I'm saying is that this is <clears throat> this is talking more about the persecution and the way in which. Christianity begin, becomes infected by the Catholic Church and its power and its authority. So it has all of this uh, supreme religious authority that, that it has, its civil authority. And then it's going to have this mixture of Christianity and paganism and use that to persecute uh, Christians, right, to to influence them. Well, I, the reason I'm I'm interjecting the way that I am yeah it's interesting because as you're pointing out with the lamet this is against yeah and if we were to look at the words as their definitions so mm -hmm. it is against the fortification a fortified place yeah so is this a type of a doubling yeah, well, it is a type of a doubling. That's that's why that's how Hebrew uses an intensification, right? Or or even a uh, what's the word? I just can't think of the word. What what does it say when we say the most? Uh, what what's that the word we call that? Um, Adjective. No, no, it's uh, superlative. Yeah, yeah. So superlative, right? Okay. So, so that's how they do it in Hebrew. They just repeat the word. Like in dying, ye shall die is translated, ye shall surely die. Okay. All so right. they just double the word. So, so we have to recognize in Hebrew, they double a word to, to make a superlative, like most or, or, 
you know, the greatest or whatever. Um, so, so in this case, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's doubled, but it's not exactly the same word, but they have a similar meaning. Now it could be just that it's a, a fortress that is a refuge, right? Just to, to emphasize that. So it's emphasis, right? Yeah. And then I'm just looking up here, the Lamed, you know, um, which is, uh, you know, literally in Hebrew, it means two or four, right? But, but often it's, it's used in the sense of against, right? Because if you're going to something, you're going against it. So it just designates the direction or goal of action. Okay. That's, that's what the Lamed means. So it wouldn't mean in, right? It's not the same as bet. Okay. So that's, so, so I think the best way to translate it here is against that he shall do this because we, because we wouldn't say to the most strongholds in English, but that's what it, it to means. It means it's the, it's direction. So it's something against the most strongholds. Okay. Does that help? Well, it, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm agreeing with you about the against. Yeah. I just, and then the you're just saying it's a doubling. You're trying to apply that to the midnight cry. Well, I'm, I'm asking the question that is it possible instead of this being what we were looking at originally against, um, something false is if if this is not an attack against something that's true yeah that's what i would say right so that's why the places of refuge where true christians have fled would be the historical application now we would have a present truth application that would be a little bit different right i mean it'd be the same but obviously different because it's present truth so it'd have to be something that we would look at in our time now he does this with a strange god Right. So the idea of the strange God. So we know that there is a God that his fathers did not know. Right. That he's going to honor with all of these idolatrous worship. And and thus shall he do against these places of refuge where true Christians have fled. So it's it's against. And, and in a sense, we could also look at this as the truth. Because one of the places of refuge, in a sense, is. Uh, the truth of God's word. Proverbs eighteen ten says, "The name of the Lord is a strong tower; the righteous run into it and are safe." Yeah, so that backs that up. Right. So, so we can see that it's it's not just where they flee, but it's also against the truth of God's word. Um, so, I could say where persecuted Christians have fled for refuge. How's that? So there can be literal places, but also really just God's word as well. So they're going to do this against God's word and against the people who hold to God's word, right? With a strange God. Now, um, normally if you see the word uh, strange in, in the Bible, it's just that word that means foreign, right? Right, the strange women, uh, it's nothing to do with what they look like or anything like that. They're just they're just foreign. It's nekar in Hebrew, and um, the first place we see it is in Genesis thirty-five two, and that's going to be. And Jacob said unto the household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. So we can see that it's it's also connected to a strange God. So this foreign God. So thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, this foreign God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. Now, this idea of acknowledgement, five, two, three, four, uh, means to scrutinize, that is to look intently at. So this would be probably uh, referred to the type of worship that you would see with Catholics regarding idols. The word increase, rabah, that's a common word. It means what it means, increase. Glory, of course, kabod. We're familiar with that, like ichabod, you know, the glory is departed. Um, so this is just glory. And cause them to rule, mashal, over many. 
and shall divide the land for gain. So we, we address that as far as um, how the Catholic Church operates um, in its uh, division of the land, so to speak, of these uh, dioceses. And <clears throat> we have these patron saints of various areas and various days and so on. Yeah. So I don't know if we need to elaborate much on the rest of it, because that would still just fall into place. Yeah. So the false gods, you know, we can say like the saints, that would include like all of their idolic, all idolatrous worship uh, to rule over many, dividing the land for gain. So they're going to have you know, all these different areas. But, but you're saying also like different saints have different territories. I guess like patron yeah, saints. Yeah, I mean, look at all the schools and churches and different areas that are named for saints, right? I mean, my patron saint is Saint Angela. I mean, it's just it just goes a, a whole pile of idolatry. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and uh, and they also have these different dates for different names and stuff. I, I think my name Theodore or something is November 9th. I don't know if that's correct. So the name Theodore is uh, November 9th, Feast of Father Theodore, which is just one of the many ways I'm connected to November 9th. Right. Oh, also, do you dare start telling us to call you Father Theodore? No. But the thing is, I'm, I'm connected through a lot of symbols with this November 9th date, right? The 391 and a half, and then uh, King of the North, King of the South in Hebrew Strong's Numbers is the number of days between my birth and November 9th, 2019. So lots of other ways too. Stephen's also connected to November 9th and September 11th, as we saw. Okay. So anyway, we've got all of these, these different false gods, the saints uh, to rule over many. And, and we could say, um, also the priesthood, you know, the Catholic priesthood. That uh, could be included in that uh, priesthood. So they're going to rule over Christendom. They shall divide the land by for gain. And and we notice that for gain, that Hebrew number four two four two represents the twenty five twenty because forty two months and forty two months, right? So there was some interesting symbolism in that. Now, so that's the historical application. So we reviewed that. We modified quite a bit of it actually. Now, if we're going to put this into a present truth application, when he shall, you know, he shall not regard the gods of his fathers, paganism. I mean, papal Rome is representing what in our history? I mean, obviously it's somewhat connected with the papacy. So I don't, I don't know how to go about putting this into the present truth application specifically. Now, I just I just want to mention I probably should have mentioned it at the beginning, but uh, there was a discussion on um, and maybe this will relate to this uh, discussion on the WhatsApp group uh, regarding um, the the period of time from October twenty second uh, to May twenty first, eighteen sixty three. So, so this was just dealing with the idea that, um, uh, you know, Christ could have come back in our time, you know, we, that the end of the 2520, we have the organization of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Now, um, so Heliomar, he had it as May 21st, 1863. We know that's the same date that Odilio used in his count. Um, and the problem with that is that's what you find in Wikipedia but not in Adventist sources. So Adventists have May 23rd, 1863, as when the church officially organized, right? I'm not sure why Wikipedia has May 21, but that's what they have. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, and May 21 ends up being like a Thursday, but it's going to be the Sabbath in which that, uh, you know, maybe there's a vote on that day or something like that. But in 1863, it's going to be the Sabbath, the last day of the General Conference, where the church is recognized as officially being organized. OK, now, the interesting thing about that, if you count from October 22nd, 1844. And you count 
uh, the number of years and the number of months and the number of days, uh, it's going to be 18 years and seven months to May 21st and 18 years, seven months and two days to May 23rd. So if we got 18, uh, uh, 18, seven and two, I mean, that's the 1872, right? Which is kind of interesting. People agree with me on that. Yes, it is. Yeah. Now, it's also interesting that it's 223 months. Now, most of you wouldn't know what 223 months is, but you should based upon, you know, this eclipse that has passed. People would talk about the Soros cycle. And that's a period of 223 months. This is a lunar cycle. On, on our calendar, it's 18 years and 11 days. But lunar months, it's 223. Now, 223 lunar months, if you use an Islamic year, which is 12 months, right? So you can see the, the consistency on our calendar, uh, 223 months is going to be, you know, 18 years and seven months, right? So same on the Islamic calendar, but it's going to be a shorter period of time. It's 202 days shorter. Uh, so 223 months on our calendar, it's roughly 220 days, depending where you start. Um, or, 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 pardon me, is 18 years, seven months and, and 18 years and seven months. And it's 202 days shorter if you have 2300 lunar months. So 223 Gregorian months is 202 days longer than 223 months. So, so the Islamic calendar, in a Soros cycle gives us 18 years and seven months is the point that I'm making. Okay. <clears throat> um, How do you spell Soros? S-A-R-O-S. So it's just the Soros cycle. And you'll, you'll hear that it's 18 years and 11 days, right? Right. Because it's, it's, it's 223 lunar months and 223 lunar months is a period of 6,585 days, but if you have 203 Gregorian months, it's 6,787 days, so that's 202 days difference. So anyway, you can look that up if anybody wants to. So the Soros cycle is is just a re repetition of the lunar lunar uh, lunar cycle. Now 223 plus 777 equals a thousand. So 223 is a complement to 777, Arad has pointed out. So that, that's rather interesting as well. So we, so we have all of these connections with this, this period of time. So 223 months is a symbol that connects to 777. It connects to July 18th. And it happens to be the period of time from October 22nd, 1844 to May 21st or 23rd, depending on how you look at it. Uh, 1863. So, so I, I just bring that up. I should have brought it up at the beginning, uh, but I didn't. We talked about it before the study. Now, why did I bring it up? There was something else I was going to connect to this, what it reminded me of. I can't think of it now. It'll come back to me. I can't think of what it was. Let me see. Maybe if I look at my... Anyway, with Heliomar, I don't know what he was really getting at. Some of his stuff doesn't make much sense. But anyway, so let's just get back to here. Just look. So, so we have this historical application, and now we have to try to make a present truth application. When I think it was the 4242 that got me thinking about that again. So the 2520 in our history. So if we're going to look at uh, this 42 months, we know the 42 months. It's there's 42 months for paganism and 42 months for papalism. Um, so he shall divide the land for gain. And the other thing is we have uh, the word divide. Um, so we should actually look at that. Now, the idea of divide, um, you know, this is going to deal with the portion, right? So we know that God has this portion as well. He divides the land, you know, to, to the prom, you know, to the promised land to his people. Um, so it's, you know, we, we've dealt dealing with the portion or the lot. Um, this is a different word, uh, chalach. 
And then the land, one, two, seven, Adama, instead of Eretz, and then gain. So, and, and there's two different words translated as land in, in the Bible, generally. You have Eretz, which, which would refer to a land in the sense of like, almost like a country. And then you have Adama, from which you get the word Adam, because he's taking other ground. It's usually translated as ground. Um, so you need to say usually it's, it's translated as land 124 times earth is 53 and ground is 44. So it's still mostly translated as land, but it, but it does mean the earth or the ground. So I, I'm not sure why I, I would probably not translate it as, as ground. I would translate it as, or, or as land. I translated as earth or ground to me would make more sense because you shall divide the earth for game. Where if it was Eretz, that would be referring to like a country. So obviously, uh, if you're dealing with Adama, it would be much more inclusive. So this is the last verse before Daniel 11, verse 40. So it's describing the papal power historically. And then it's going to give us 1798. But we know that we can make an application of this to the 1798. Typifies the time of the end, but but verse forty B is going to refer to nineteen eighty nine. So I don't know, I'm not sure how to do this with the present truth application. This is all I'm trying to say here. What should we do with it? How should we approach taking these three verses? I mean, we could say, well, this is what has happened. In our history, uh, in a period of time that would have to parallel the 1260. So that would be the period of time prior to 1989. So, or, right, so we, we could have that. We could just say, this is referring to the history of, of Adventism during that period prior to 1989. Or we could apply it within the movement itself, within within our history, within our lines, as we have been doing often with the present truth application. Now, as far as keys or clues to understand that, um, we sometimes use uh, these Hebrew numbers, right? So we have those first three words of verse 37. Um, There are... uh, uh, five nine two one three eight zero eight nine nine five, and if you add them together, you get ten thousand uh, seven hundred and twenty-four. So, what would we do with that? Ten thousand seven hundred and twenty-four. Now we know that's almost thirty years. It's two hundred and thirty-three days short. And if we count ten thousand seven hundred and twenty-four, and we start on November ninth, nineteen eighty-nine, it's going to bring us to March twenty-first. 2019. So March 21st, 2019. And that is, uh, you know, 233 days prior to November 9th, 2019. So, I mean, March 21st, you could say it's, you know, first day of spring, sort of the first full day of spring. It would be the Jewish spring equinox. Does that help us in any way? It's bringing us into our history. It might, but wasn't Christ supposed to return on March, March the 21st of 44 to at one point? Or was it 43? Yeah, they, in 44, right? So March 21st, 1844 is, is the original date they had for the end of the Jewish year. You know, once they started using the Jewish year, because originally 1843 was January 1st to December 31st, 1843, right? Then at the, in December of 1842, Miller writes that he actually considers 1843 to go from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844, which he marks as March 21st in, as the start of the Jewish year, even though technically the Jewish year doesn't start on March 21st in 1843, but it does end on March 21st in 1844. That is the first day of the first month. On the rabbinic and the Karaite calendar in 1844 is March 21st. And, and originally this movement had March 21st 
as the first day of the first month, because nobody had done the math to count, you know, 186 days to the 10th day of the seventh month. So, um, you know, if you look at this movement back in 2000, well, before we had the first day of the fifth month. So if you were looking in 2012, we're going to have March 21st as the first disappointment, not April 19th. Okay. So, yeah, so March 21st has that symbol of, of the first disappointment, sort of. But but it is interesting that it's close to that 30 days. Now, it's 233 days difference, you know, when we get to November 9th to be 30 years. So then we have, uh, so we have that phrase. I'm just going to put a footnote there and just so we don't forget about it. So this, uh, I guess I can take this way and just take all these little plus signs between them. It's 10,724, I think I said. Yeah. Okay, so 10,724 days from November 9th, 1989 to March 21st. 2019. Now, whether that, that, that helps us as far as the present truth application, um, it may. Okay, so we have uh, the gods, the pagan gods of his fathers. So the father is paganism. Maybe we could even just say pagan Rome, I think might even be better in this context. So anything else that we can use here symbolically just looking back here so he's not going to regard the the gods of pagan rome nor the desire of women that is that he's going to reject the promised seed nor regard any god because he's going to magnify himself above all any thoughts anything that we can do with any of this where it says desire of of the, the desire, it says of, desire of could it be translated desire for like I just want to confirm that okay so um so what does the Hebrew how would you translate the Hebrew yeah, so, so I, well I can bring up the uh you sword but I, yeah, well, I, that just came to my mind because I want to be right about this because Esword's not going to help you too much uh because it's it's not going to give you I mean you could look at the Hebrew if you could read Hebrew um, I can't. Yeah. So, okay, that's interesting. Now, now the word woman here. Okay. So that's where you, we might have, uh, not nashim. Okay. It, it says, so it's a feminine plural. And I, I'm looking on, um, scholars gateway. So it, it gives me a breakdown of these words, uh, what they call a parsing of the word. Now, uh, the Hebrew number that's given is different there. So here we have the number word, uh, is 802. So let's go to the, so 802 is the word that's given, can refer to a wife or a woman, right? The first place that this word shows up is Genesis 2.22. Um, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So she, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Right. So that word woman there, I'm just going here. Right. You can see it's Isha. Right. So that's woman. Now it can also be Nashim. Right. In this case, in, in Genesis 2.22, it's actually Isha. Now, Nashim is another form of that word, right? It, it's got um, a noon at the beginning, and um, it has a, a plural at the end. And so that's just the, the plural form of woman, right? So you have Isha, that's the singular. Nashim is the plural. Does that make sense? That Hebrew, that's how they do their yeah. plurals. Okay. Now, so when we go back to this, uh, in my scholar's gateway, 
They actually don't have 802. They have 801. And, and this would give it a very different meaning. Um, so the Hebrew 80, uh, 800, for instance, Esha, right, which means fire. And then 800, 801 means burnt offering, offering made by fire, right? So, so that's the way the scholar gateway interprets that word. Now, I would say that it's actually 802 is the correct one. So, because uh, when I look at the Hebrew itself in this, uh, in this, um, verse, it, you know, we have 802, but you can see the Nisha, which is, is a woman or, or, you know, it could be a wife, but just a woman, right? A woman, a wife, a female, the opposite of a man, a woman married to a man, female of animals, right? So, so sometimes you look at these tools, they'll give you quite different, uh, meanings, but I think desire of women is probably the correct one. So just, just a little note on that. I, I don't so know if that helps. Desire yeah. of and not desire for. That's what I wanted to clarify more, more than anything. Yeah, well, in, in Hebrew, they don't have a for or a of. So, okay. right, so, so they just have, um, uh, this, this word here, which is, uh, kemda, which is the de- delight or desire, right? So desire, that which is desirable or pleasant. So I would just say it, it would be the desire of women, the, pleasantness of women or something like that but yeah it's it yeah of or for i don't think that there just isn't really words for that in 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 here but anyway that that helps kind of clarify i think that we're we're correct in what we have interpreted there in that text that this this would refer to one is it's a godly desire it's not like lust so we're going to interpret Thank God is speaking to us. Yeah. So, so this would be that, that this, the papacy rejects Christ, right? The promised seed. Um, and doesn't regard any, any God. He's the God, right? God on earth. Now, just as far as still trying to get this, you know, we're going to have to think about this. I, I still don't know quite how to put this into the present truth. I mean, we could just find parallels to these things. And, and this isn't particularly drawn on a line, this part, though it does have, we know it's it's describing the papacy during the 1260. And so that 4242, the last word of that section, uh, you know, giving us that 25. I think I can put it into the present truth movement. If we are not advancing and growing and understanding prophecy and Paul Moni, and we're retracting and retrograding and abandoning our foundations. What foundation then do we have? It's man's subjectivity and we get our minds off the coming of Christ. Soon we'll probably be, for some of us, there is no Sunday law. Let's all go back to the churches or to the world as some already have. It yeah. starts in the mind and eventually it leads to the feet going back. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry to say that, but I can see this, and that's why I am desperately, not desperately, but fervently clinging to what I have here. Even though I don't understand it all, I'm willing to accept it as from God and just go on from there. I can't yeah. afford to look back or to go back or to say yeah. we were led wrong. Because if we were misled, then we were on the hot cloud of Satan. Now for us to say we were misled, now we're under the cloud of Satan because we're abandoning the, the foundation. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the difficulties, so just to kind of reiterate, you know, some of the difficulties that we have with the idea that our movement went off track whenever you're going to say that that was, whether it's 2013 or 2014, 2015, whatever doctrine that this movement had, if this movement wasn't being led of God for a number of years, I don't see how the movement can then decide, oh, well, you know, we were wrong. Now we want you to follow the movement again because we are on the right track now, right? You understand what I'm saying? 
it, it, it's hard to just go back and say, at this point, we went off track. And yet everything that that we went off track with came from what came before. Right. You always have to go back and say, well, if we were wrong about July 18, then then maybe we're wrong about October 22nd. Maybe we're wrong about the crucifixion of Christ. Right. It, it, you can't. Once you start pulling at that thread, the whole sweater unravels, at least, you know, in the old days when you knitted them by hand. And that's the problem. Either God was leading us or he wasn't. And if he wasn't. Well, we would have to we would have to start over. We can't just decide we're going to pick up somewhere, right? E- even in my own personal experience, when when I wandered away from God for a while back in uh, the you know, let's say the early two thousands, late nineteen nineties, um, where I wasn't really doing what God wanted me to do, um, when I finally um, woke up to reality and that's coming into this movement in 2010 and he, and even a bit before that I really had to re-examine everything that is I had to see uh, you know one is I recognized that I wasn't following God but I had to repent of a lot of things and but I had to re-examine my entire Christian belief I had to go right back to the beginning and, and it took time, right? And I didn't just ignore the past, right? If, if we were wrong, if the movement was wrong about July 18th, you would need to go back and look at everything and examine it and show where it was wrong. You can't just say, well, we were wrong and now you need to, here's, we're just going to, because there's something that led you to that, right? And if you're not going to understand the whole picture, and, and especially if people are asking, you know, if people are asking us to say, well, just, we were wrong about July 18th, nothing happened, so you just need to repent. Well, that's not a very good uh, explanation. You would have to go through and say, well, what about all of these evidences? How do you address each of them? How do you address the unsealing of the seven thunders. You know, you, you have to go back and look at everything. So in, in trying to look at this as the present truth, we're going to try to do this tomorrow. We're going to say, well, who's pagan Rome represent or papal Rome represent in the present truth application? Um, that's, that's what we have to decide. Are we going to make this broad or a narrower, narrower focus? So anyway, let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, and I pray for each person. I ask that you can bless them, help them in their day-to-day life, and help us, Lord, to follow and serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.